Well, strictly speaking, physics is time symmetric in the sense that all the classical equations r can run forward or back. All you have to do is state the initial conditions, run it in one direction, see what happens. The only thing in all of physics that has time irreversibility in it is the second law of thermodynamics, which says that in any interaction, the degree of disorder will at best remain the same, but, but in the vast host of cases will increase so that you can tell the arrow of time by the increase in disorder. But at the level of particles and so forth, there uh, is in the equations no second law of thermodynamics. Right, so that let you have particles that move backward in time. Do particles like that really exist? I thought if anything actually went into the past, we'd end up with all sorts of strange paradoxes. There is a particle called a tachyon. We hypothesize exists. I say, yes, it does exist. And if so, the first thing that a scientist would do would be, say, not try to build some kind of chamber and send himself backward in time, but just to send a message. Just sending the message can create a paradox. Um, you tell your grandfather to do something that makes it impossible for him to meet his grandmother, for example. But in this novel, the timescape, in a sense, splits in two. And you get two outcomes. One in which, the, say, the, the grandfather never made you, and you didn't exist, and therefore the message didn't come back. The other one in which the grandfather didn't get the message. Something failed. And, or there may be other choices. You don't know that it only splits in two. It could be three, four, five, ad infinitum. Uh, the whole idea behind the book was people were doing experiments to, to see if tachyons could be detected. If they were detected, then here came this immense problem. And, and in a sense, I was working out in the novel the physics that would be necessary to explain this problem if tachyons were found. And so far, they haven't been, not reliably though some experiments have turned up some evidence that they might be there. Well, I'll keep my eyes open. Thanks, Greg. Mm, I guess we'll have to wait for the experiments to catch up with that theory. That's right. Jeffrey had tachyon-free time travel in his Nebula award-winning story, Ripples in the Dirac Sea. Why did you draw upon Paul Dirac's work for the time travel in Ripples in the Dirac Sea? I really wanted to write a story that had some modern physics in it. It seems that most of science fiction often kind of, st kind of stops after Kepler and Galileo and Newton, and they understand the laws of rocket mechanics and orbits, but don't go much further. That even the science fiction that deals with quantum mechanics really stops with the quantum mechanics of the 1920s, with Schrodinger and with Heisenberg, and doesn't go on to the very fascinating quantum mechanics that Dirac developed in the quantum field theories. Yeah, the only other story I recall that used Dirac's work was James Blish's 1954 story, Beep, about a faster-than-light communicator. You obviously did a lot of research into Dirac. How did he come up with his unusual theories? He came up with an equation, and then he said, well, what does this equation mean? It seems to be right, but what does it mean? And the only way that he could make it mean something in the real world was to postulate that all around us we are surrounded by an infinitely dense sea of negative energy particles. Everywhere inside of you, inside the Earth, all around us, in empty space, in space that's packed with matter, everywhere there's this infinitely dense sea of negative matter. And another interesting thing that was pointed out was this, these negative uh, energy states. Uh, in quantum mechanics, negative energy formally corresponds to states that move backwards in time. OK, it might be possible, it might not. Time will tell. But what draws SF writers to time travel isn't its scientific possibility. It's the amazing narrative potential. Writers who've done time, time and again, include Harry Turtledove, Philip K. Dick, and Robert Silverberg, whose latest is a collaboration updating Isaac Asimov's classic The Ugly Little Boy, in which a Neanderthal child is plucked from the past for scientific study. Bob, it's Commander Rick. How did you and Isaac explain the fact that time travel didn't create huge paradoxes in the ugly little boy? We lied. Time travel really is, uh, is fantasy, uh, unless you subscribe to the, uh, the, the tachyon theory of, of small particles moving backward in time. I suppose you, you have a mathematical substructure that makes sense. 
For the rest of it, it is a convention that we employ to get on with the story. So you don't feel any need to provide those sort of scientific explanations like Greg Benford did in Timescape? I think we need to distinguish between scientific explanation and science. Uh, Greg is a physicist and has the vocabulary of science uh, greatly at his command. I'm a science fiction writer who has picked up much of this vocabulary. It's not my native language as it is with Greg's. He knows, as I know, that it's all nonsense, that we are working with arbitrary literary conventions. He found better wallpaper to put on than most of us can do to disguise the cracks in the walls. But in fact, time travel is a very uh, chancy concept. When uh, I wrote a book called Up the Line, which I think is, is my fundamental statement on the issue of time travel, I tried to explore in a, a comic, but serious-minded way, all of the paradoxes of time travel. If everybody goes back to, to see the crucifixion, the hill on which Jesus and the two thieves was crucified will be covered with millions of tourists. Sure. This is a paradox that needs to be addressed. I addressed it. I addressed it thumb to the nose in some ways, uh, but I tried to play with all of this. This is part of the fun of science fiction, the intellectual game. Once we begin to delude ourselves into thinking that we're literally predicting the future, we're fit to be taken away. Right. Do you have a favorite time travel story, something maybe you wish that you'd written? Well, I think the favorite has to be H.G. Wells' uh, Time Machine, which is one of the two or three stories that led me into science fiction in the first place. Uh, the, the vision of the far future, I don't mean the Eloi and the Morlocks particularly, although that was wonderful stuff. I mean. The journey that the time traveler takes to the end of time, I keep talking about the, the, the red sun and the crab crawling on the beach. I was 10 years old when I encountered that, and I thought, I will never live to see these things, who will? But here he's showing them to me anyway. And that has stayed with me in over the last 45 years and more as uh, the great time travel story. But also there's... Uh, Robert A. Heinlein's By His Bootstraps, uh, very different in its effect because it doesn't attempt particularly to conjure up the wonders of the distant and unimaginable future, but simply sends the same character on a series of time loops. And this showed me what the intellectual side of the time travel story could be like. If I had to pick one that I wish I had written, I think it would be By His Bootstraps. The one that I would regard as my favorite would be The Time Machine. Great choices. Thanks, Bob. By His Bootstraps is also one of Spider Robinson's two favorite time travel tales, according to his tribute to Heinlein, entitled Raw, Raw, Raw. Spider told me about his other favorite Heinlein story, All You Zombies. Well, it's, it's essentially a science fiction dirty joke and a good one. It's the man who was his own mother and father uh, through the agency of a time machine and a simple sex change, uh, a sort of a born hermaphrodite who functions as female up until she becomes impregnated, has a child, the stress of giving birth completes the transition from female to male, whereupon she meets a time traveler who picks her up, puts her, he now, sorry, he meets a time traveler who picks him up, puts him in a time machine, brings him back and allows him to impregnate himself. Then they jump ahead nine months in the time machine and take the baby girl that results and bring that back in time so it can be, grow up to become the girl who is impregnated by herself so that she can give birth to herself so that and the man with the time machine has done all this in order to recruit our hero into the time police so that one day he can become the one who will make it possible for him to impregnate himself and therefore be born as a complete closed loop in time a story in which if any of the events in it had not taken place none of the events would exist it ends with the protagonist the agent of the time police, now a grizzled old veteran who's just finished making it possible for himself to exist. He goes back to the barracks and he lays down in his bunk and he looks down at the Caesarean scar on his belly and says, I know who I am, but who are all you zombies out there? Uh, that's, that's, that's elegant, that's beautiful, that's perfect. And, and as so often in perfect science fiction metaphors or plots, Robert got there first. <laughs>